Welcome to our podcast. Uh, this will be over the first half of chapter 5. Uh, this is going to go over macromolecules. Uh, so in this one I want to go over what polymers are, what monomers are, how those fit with macromolecules, and we'll cover carbohydrates and lipids. So uh, two of the major macromolecules, uh, there's four total, but we'll cover the first two here. Uh, so starting off, macromolecule, you should be able to figure that one out. Macro means big. Molecule means molecule. Uh, so these are big molecules. Uh, we're going to kind of use some other terms for them, just to spruce things up, if you will. Uh, so we're typically going to say that macromolecules are typically polymers. Uh, this isn't always true, but in general, uh, when you talk about polymers, they're, they're types of macromolecules. Uh, so macromolecules are big molecules. Many big molecules are polymers. And if you break this one down, it's many mers. All right. uh, really what this is, is it's just a molecule that's big uh, that's going to be made up of these smaller pieces. So mono, this is one, so it's going to be when we take these small pieces and stick them together to make a polymer. So if you want, you can kind of think of this where you have a Lego stolen from my kids here. Uh, this would be like a monomer. We'll talk about carbohydrates next, so I'm going to use that as an example. Uh, this could be glucose. Just a simple sugar. Uh, this is the stuff that you have that floats around in your blood that you can use for energy. Uh, you can convert it more long term into fat. Uh, but this is like blood sugar glucose. All right. I can take a glucose and I can stick it with other glucoses. Uh, I can also stick it with other simple sugars uh, like fructose, uh, galactose. So it doesn't have to be exactly identical, but it has to be the same general type. So in other words, it has to be a monosaccharide, is what it'll be called, a monomer of that specific thing. So I can take these little pieces of carbohydrate, these monomers of carbohydrates, and I can stick them together in chains. All right? As I stick these together in these chains, that is what a polymer is. It's held together in this case by what would be covalent bonds between each of these units. Now these covalent bonds can be, in the right conditions, broken apart. So that would allow us then to go back, in many cases, to being just simple monomers. Now, now looking at that kind of sticking together and breaking apart, we can see, all right, one, and then we've got a whole bunch, all right? That's really badly drawn, but get used to it. Uh, but there's two ways of going about this. One way is going to kind of go in this direction, and the other way is going to go in the opposite direction. So one way is going to make you go from being kind of single pieces to pieces that are tied together in these big chains. And some of them will go from being big chains to being single pieces. Now a dehydration synthesis, the synthesis should kind of tip you off. This is going to be when we go from being a bunch of monomers to build a polymer. So we're going to stick them together, synthesis. Okay, and the dehydration part is because we do that by removing a water. So we'll typically, and I'm not going to expect you to know exact details, but I think this helps. We're going to have some molecule, which I will draw as a circle because I'm really good at drawing. Uh, and we'll have an OH group sticking off the end of it. And then we'll have our other monomer that'll have, and just to make things simple, I'll write HO, just reversed. Okay, so we now have an OHHO that are kind of sticking facing each other between these two molecules. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the two H's and one of the O's and we're going to make an H2O. All right, nothing crazy going on here. Two H's and an O, H2O. And then what's going to happen is these two molecules now, these two monomers that we had, are going to end up stuck together with an oxygen in between them because there was one oxygen left. So now that oxygen binds these two pieces together. And then you can continue doing this. So I'll just draw some more going down, because I don't have really room elsewise. Uh, you can continue doing this to make really long chains where it could just go on and on and on and on. And so we're, that's the dehydration synthesis part, is it's the common way where we will take a bunch of small pieces and stick them together to make big pieces by removing a water. Dehydration. Okay. So you're removing a water from it, so you get a water separately. Now hydrolysis will be the exact opposite. 
So in hydrolysis, we're going to add a water to two things that are already bonded. And by adding that, you let it go from having just that oxygen holding them together to going back to the way that it was, where it's two separate molecules, each with its own OH. All right, so we're just doing the exact reverse. So hydrolysis is going to be ultimately going from a polymer to smaller pieces, of which the smallest you can get to, obviously, is a monomer. I'm not going to say you can't just go from a polymer to a smaller polymer. You could. But in general, you're breaking it down into smaller pieces. That's hydrolysis. Lysis, break. Hydro, you're adding water. Okay, moving on from here, we have carbohydrates. This will be our first macromolecule we'll talk about. Uh, you guys see carbohydrates on the back of food labels. This is a common thing. Uh, typically, they'll end in oses, fructose, lactose, galactose, glucose. Uh, so that's a common ending for sugars. And we're going to call their monomers monosaccharides. So when I say monosaccharide, that's the monomer. That's the small piece. That is the single Lego piece, you know, the smallest subunit. And so they're typically going to have a ratio of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen that's CH2O. Now that doesn't mean that their chemical formula is going to be CH2O, but it's going to be some multiple of that, which we call N. So in other words, glucose is C6H12O6. Now sometimes when we bind them together, you'll see because we removed a water, you'll get these numbers be slightly off from that 1 to 2 to 1, but they're going to be very, very close to this 1 to 2 to 1 ratio even as they get bigger. All right, so you might see something where it's like C12H22O11, where we removed a water to stick two of these smaller guys together, but you can still see it's about that 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. And it's that 1 to 2 to 1 ratio that's critical in identifying, oh yeah, this is a carbohydrate. And we use this in our body f rapidly to get energy because it's floating around in our blood, because typically glucose, that's a carbohydrate. Uh, so this is an easy thing to dump in the blood to get to the cells rapidly. Uh, it's not good for long-term storage. It, it's not energy efficient. You wouldn't want to store your energy as glucose or a carbohydrate. Uh, you would be huge. Uh, but we can convert it to fat or protein when needed. So if we want to store things long-term, we can convert things to fat. That's great to store. Obviously, if you're very active, you might convert it to protein, uh, which would allow you to build muscle. This is also why you probably don't need to drink tons and tons of protein to try and get bigger because your body can convert what you have to other substances. Uh, in this case, protein would be an option. So monomer, monosaccharide, carbohydrates, common stuff, we normally associate them with sugars. And when you see the term saccharide, you should be thinking sugars, carbs. That's kind of their, their, their way of saying it. Now disaccharide is just going to be two monosaccharides stuck together. So right here, this one's going to be sucrose, where we have a glucose and a fructose, two monosaccharides, that stick together to make sucrose. That's it. So we will do a dehydration synthesis to stick them together. So that goes from two monos to a disaccharide. So we can have mono, monosaccharide, disaccharide. And if we do hydrolysis, that will make them go from being a disaccharide to a monosaccharide. So when you ingest stuff like sucrose, table sugar, your body will then break it down into a fructose and a glucose, which your body then can do what it wants with. All right. The last type is going to be polysaccharides. These are the most complex. Uh, these are going to be oftentimes very, very long chains of monosaccharides. I mean, they can be thousands and thousands long. And there's two basic reasons we use them for. Plants will use them for storage as starch. So this is like potatoes, a lot of root vegetables. Uh, plants don't store as much of their energy as fats as like we would, uh, so they'll use starch. And we will store some of our glucose as glycogen. Uh, it's very similar to starch. It's just a little bit more branched in many cases. Uh, it just has some more strings kind of coming off of the main strand, if you will. Uh, but we do that in our liver, and we do that so when we need sugar, like when you've exercised and you haven't eaten, so there's not sugar that you've ingested to use, we can break the glycogen down into its monosaccharides, glucose, 
and release it in the bloodstream. So this is how we kind of control our blood sugars using this glycogen, but this is not long, long-term storage. This is not like, wow, I've been overeating and I've got 20 pounds to store. You'd store that as fat or else you'd end up storing like 120 pounds instead of 20 because whenever you store stuff as, as a carbohydrate, it, it takes up a lot more space. Uh, it's more massive, which is why our body doesn't use this for long-term storage. If you eat a lot of sugar, you convert a lot of that sugar to fat, not glycogen. It's not efficient that way. You can also use carbohydrates for structure. Plants, uh, their cell walls have a lot of cellulose. This is one of the things that helps make them rigid. Uh, so they'll use this structurally, and you'll see it's a very similar thing to starch. It's just the way it bonds is slightly different. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into it, but you can see that it kind of just flips the way that the monosaccharide's facing. Uh, and then there is chitin. This one's used in a variety of things. You'll find this in insects, exo insect exoskeletons. Uh, you'll find chitin used in uh, certain fungus. We'll have them in the outside parts. Uh, but this one's a string of what they sometimes call nitrogenous sugars because it's got this nitrogen that's on the sugar. Uh, but this is an earwig. Uh, and you can see that this outside of this, that crunchy part, uh, of an insect or a variety of things, crustaceans, etc., cetera, uh, that's gonna be made of chitin. So that one is a durable thing that it can be used for structure. Don't think all carbs are just like sugars that you eat and that's that. Uh, they can be stored as durable molecules uh, that can be used to help reinforce your structure. Now lipids, uh, this is kind of an interesting group. It doesn't have a true monomer. Uh, and there's lots of different types. You've got fats, oils, steroids. Uh, we'll get more into those. Uh, but there's different types, and there's not like one set subunit. They tend to be hydrophobic, and this is because they have a whole bunch of carbon and hydrogen bonds, which is essentially nonpolar. And so that means they don't really like water. So most people know the idea of water and oil don't mix. Uh, fats don't dissolve in water. So that's kind of the idea it is in general, you're gonna have where lipids don't like water. That's one of the unique things about them versus most other macromolecules. We're gonna commonly store our fats as triglycerides. There's lots of other types of fats, but this is like the common one that you find in our bloodstream uh, that you find in fat cells. Uh, and this will have two varieties uh, as well as other fats have these varieties, saturated versus unsaturated. And how this works is a saturated fat has no double bonds. So its tails are kind of nice and straight. Whereas when you add a double bond, it makes that tail kink a little bit because that double bond shifts the molecule. And so the tail is no longer quite as straight. It kind of sticks out a bit. And so what that does is if you have unsaturated fats in a membrane, like our cell membranes or our organelle membranes, it makes them space out a bit more because that tail kind of gets in the way. And so this is useful when things get cold because as it gets cold, molecules try to slow down, all right? They tend to compact. And so this can help keep them spread out. It can help keep them fluid. Uh, whereas saturated fats have the opposite effect uh, where ultimately they would help keep things more dense. That could be more useful if you're in like hot temperatures. So this will be significant. Uh, and that actually works out where saturated fats tend to be solid at room temperature. Uh, so that's why we commonly call them fats, whereas unsaturated fats are commonly called oils, and they will tend to be liquid at room temperature. So you have like vegetable oil, a lot of plant stuff is unsaturated, a lot of animal stuff is gonna be saturated. Uh, you don't have where your, your bacon grease just kind of like runs off unless you really heat it. Uh, that's gonna be solid otherwise. Moving along here, phospholipids. This is another type of lipid. It's, it's similar to a triglyceride, except it's only got two tails instead of three. Uh, the tri part, obviously, was referring to the tails. Uh, this is what most of our membranes are made up of, uh, and they're typically arranged in a bilayer, where it means that they've got one like row of them with the heads facing out, and then there's another row of them with the heads facing in. And the reason for this is most fats have this kind of polar head region. Oftentimes it's a glycerol uh, and it, it's okay with water. You know, the head region's fine, it's polar. Then there's these long carbon and hydrogen, hydrocarbon is what they refer to that as, tail, which is very nonpolar. It does not like water. 
And so that's why we get these formations like a bilayer, or this is called a micelle, uh, which is similar except just a sphere. This is what happens when you drop some in water. Where the tails try to get together and they try to face away from the water. So that way the water is out here. It's outside this, this droplet. It's outside this bilayer. And the tails are just facing each other where there's no water, so they're happy. The heads, which are facing the water, they could care less. You know, it doesn't really bother them that they're facing water because they're polar. But this is why your, your phospholipids make, and lipids in general, make very good barriers because they want to stick together and they will form these bilayers, they will form these micelles, they'll form these structures uh, pretty much automatically. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on uh, when we get to the idea of where we might have gotten our first cells. And this idea that because they're hydrophobic in certain parts that they form these structures will be an important bit for this. Okay, moving on. Steroids are kind of a unique lipid. Uh, they're not really like the other ones almost at all. Uh, they've got these four fused carbon rings. You can see here we've got one, two, three, four rings. And they literally are typically, a, I guess you'd say, a hexagon or a pentagon uh, stuck together. And then there's oftentimes these pieces that can stick off from either end. And those can vary based upon which type of, as well as the stuff that's on the rings, can vary based upon which steroid this is. Uh, the one that this is showing you guys, the one that I'm showing overall, and the one we talk about most is cholesterol. Because our body does need cholesterol, we use cholesterol. It's in our cell membranes as well as our organelle membranes. Uh, it gets in there and helps keep it fluid by spacing things out. Uh, it's also a hormone precursor, and what that means is we make other hormones from it, such as testosterone. You may have heard of this. Uh, if you're a guy, you hopefully have some of this. Females have a small amount, but not as much. Uh, it also makes things like estradiol, which is essentially the common thing that's referred to as estrogen, that kind of group. Uh, so that one's found largely or predominantly in females and in pretty large amounts. Uh, it also makes other ones that we'll get into later in the thing, like postaglandins. Uh, but it's used for a bunch of stuff like that. And then there's some negative effects that can happen where it can kind of glob up with some fats in your arteries. Uh, and it can block them. And so ultimately you've kind of got your artery that's supplying blood to your, your, your heart. And then you get these fats and these cholesterols that kind of stick to the sides and they start to just take up space. It's just a blob that blocks up part of it. It's like throwing trash on the highway or something and starting to block off lanes until eventually you can block it off almost completely. Uh, and then that stops the blood from getting to your heart is usually where these arteries are. They're coronary arteries. And if you don't get blood to your heart, that part of the heart dies. And then that's what leads to the heart attack. Uh, so atherosclerosis is just one of the kind of issues that can come from this. There are some negative things that can be tied to cholesterol. Uh, but overall, cholesterol is ne necessary. And it is a pretty good molecule. It gets a bad rap. Uh, fats in general get a bad rap. Sugars and carbs are probably significantly worse for you, uh, especially the simple sugars uh, and things like starch and, and uh, the ones that are easy to break down are probably far worse than you than, than many or most fats and, and even cholesterol. Other than that, I don't know that I have anything else that I have to go through. Let's see here. I think that's it. So. That's it for this podcast. I'll pick up with proteins and nucleic acids, which is the next one. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed this, and I'll catch you guys later.